So this is um, a didactic focused on cardiac resynchronization therapy for heart failure. Um, and we'll go to the next slide here. All right, so this is a case vignette. This is actually someone I took care of during fellowship, a 52-year-old woman with a history of idiopathic cardiomyopathy. And she came into clinic, exertional dyspnea and fatigue with minimal activity, so she's a class three. Uh, she's on great medicines, ACE inhibitor, beta blockers. Uh, she's on aldosterone antagonism. Um, she's on uh, a little bit of diuretic. Uh, and then on exam, her blood pressure is soft but reasonable. Um, her heart rate is well controlled. She doesn't really have evidence of elevated filling pressures. Uh, and so she's not acutely decompensated, uh, though she does have trace peripheral edema. Um, her ECG just does show shyness rhythm with a left bundle wrench block. And can you hear? OK. And so we took her for echocardiography. And if you ignore the flicker, you can see she has a big, sick left ventricle. And in the short axis view, you can really see that dyssynchrony there. The, the heart segments are not all contracting in unison owing to that left bundle branch block. And she has a fair amount of mitral regurgitation as well on uh, color Doppler. So she has marked LV enlargement. She has moderate MR. And she has severe LV dysfunction with an EF of 20%. And so here's the quiz question. So who gets the next call on this patient? Do you call the chaplain? Last rites? I guess they used to do that, right? Cardiac surgery consult to repair that moderate MR? Do you call the heart failure service for heart transplant workup? Or do you call the EP service for a biventricular ICD? Okay. Not to say you wouldn't end up calling some of those other folks later, but I think initially class one guidelines for implantation of CRT. And then some of the deeper questions we'll talk about, uh, would she benefit from CRT optimization post-implant? Uh, does mechanical dyssynchrony matter? And can we really measure it? Uh, where should we place the LV lead? Will she be a CRT responder? What are the factors that predict whether she'll respond? Uh, and then the importance of the QRS duration, the QRS morphology. Uh, and then we'll talk about some tools we can use to help get the <laughs> LV lead to the best location. Uh, so we know now, and we're well in the era of primary prevention ICD, but um, in the early 2000s, when we're learning all of this with Scud Heft and, and, and Made It Too, that folks, after getting the primary prevention ICD, you weren't done with them. So these are folks who were dying in their 50s and 60s of sudden cardiac arrest. But now they're living. They're surviving that. But they're getting heart failure. And so now really, and there's been a push here at Swedish with um, Dr. Mignone and the advanced heart failure team, because these folks are now surviving. And they're getting heart failure. They're, 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 they're class 2 patients that are becoming class 3 and class 4 now because they're surviving. Uh, and we need to obviously deal with that. Um, and as an aside, so with device therapy now, CRT, and we're talking about an LVAD program here, potentially in the next year or two, the, it's, it's going to come full circle. So they're going to survive advanced heart failure, and then we're going to be left holding the bag on their ventricular arrhythmias, particularly slow VT. There's going to be an explosion of slow VT in these folks at post-CRT and post-LVAD because, again, these are folks who would have died of progressive heart failure, and now they're allowed to live. And so get ready for slow VT. I remember in the Duke clinics, we'd have folks come in with one week of sustained VT on their LVAD because, again, they're hemodynamically fairly well, well compensated, um, but it's something that we'll have to deal with. So one of the early studies on CRT, and this is, I can't believe it's 10 years old now, the CARE-HF, it was a European study that looked at folks with an ejection fraction of less than or equal to 35%, QRS width of greater than uh, 120, um, and these were your sick patients. So these were class 3 and ambulatory class 4 on optimal medications. Um, and they did throw in that um, they had to meet two of three now antiquated dyssynchrony measurements if their QRS was more intermediate range. Um, and they were all, per protocol, echo-optimized post-implant. Um, and the endpoint of death or cardiac hospitalization with CRT was dramatically reduced. Uh, as you can see in the, um, don't have the, uh, the pointer there, but if you, as you can see in the top slide versus medical therapy. And more importantly, there's a reduction in all-cause mortality from 
to 20%, and this is just two and a half years of follow-up. And if those numbers sound high, it's because they are. So this was, can't believe it was 10 years ago, but these were sick patients, and this was before the era where people were routinely getting, certainly in Europe at this time, primary prevention ICDs had not yet penetrated. Actually, CARE-HF did not even look at the issue of defibrillation. This was CRT pacing only without the ICD. Dramatic improvement in survival. Um, the other thing that had not quite penetrated is beta blockers were still sort of considered optional as part of your medical therapy. So these were all, all patients who were on ACE inhibitors. But in the era now where they're on ACE, beta blockers, ALDO antagonists, getting primary prevention ICDs, and now getting CRT, you'll see the mortality numbers are dramatically reduced. Um, and here's one example. So made at CRT, a more contemporary study looked at the issue of milder heart failure. So initially, to qualify for CRT, you had to be functional class three or four. Now, indication creep had set in long before made at CRT, where we were taking patients who were class two and saying they were class three, essentially. And we knew they benefited, but now here's the randomized data to back that up. Um, as you can see, this is the area where everyone's getting an ICD. They're randomized to an ICD without CRT versus an ICD with CRT. And the probability of survival free of heart failure hospitalization dramatically reduced in the arm that got the CRT. Just to go through the criteria, so for made at CRT, and I remember we were still enrolling my first year of fellowship for this, EF less than 30%. QRS width greater than or equal to 130. And these were folks who are class 1s and class 2s, so they actually feel generally OK. Uh, it was both ischemics and non-ischemics, and they were randomized, like I said, to CRT with the defibrillator or just the defibrillator. And over about two and a half years of follow-up, there was a one-third reduction in the event of either heart failure hospitalization or mortality. Um, now, compared to CARE-HF, the mortality at baseline was only about 3% in both arms. So really, with early CRT, you're not necessarily improving survival up front because these patients aren't that sick and they have the ICD. It's more the progression of the disease, progression to where they're getting progressive heart failure is reduced significantly with the CRT device. Um, and we also knew as secondary endpoints that CRT was associated with significant reductions in LV volume improvements in ejection fraction. And these are all things that may not benefit the patient immediately. But again, you're looking at three, five, six, potentially 10 years down the road that they're doing better. Uh, and it was so much so that we went ahead and just rewrote the guidelines with a focused update that looked at this issue of CRT in mild heart failure. And so now CRT gets a class one indication for folks who have an EF of less than or equal to 35% in sinus rhythm with a left bundle branch block. And they looked at a subgroup to say QRS duration greater than or equal to 150 milliseconds. Um, and that's based on the best practices uh, and the best data we have from made at CRT and other trials. There was a trial after this, the RAFT, that also looked at this issue. But also, CRT is reasonable for folks who have a more intermediate range QRS duration, left bundle branch block with a QRS from 120 to 149. And so it's still a class 2A, still very reasonable to consider in those folks, knowing that they may not have um, uh, as predictable a response. Um, class 2B is considering it in folks uh, potentially with non-left bundle branch block patterns. Uh, so may be considered in folks, for example, with a right bundle, may be considered in folks who have a non-specific IVCD. Uh, and so those are folks that we will, will often um, do some more testing to figure out who will respond and who won't. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we talked about the implant techniques. Fairly standard. Um, the CRT implant with the current tools doesn't take much longer than it does to implant a standard defibrillator system, again, because the tools have been customized over several generations now. Uh, we have these preformed catheters we talked about to get into the coronary sinus. We typically will do a balloon occlusive venogram in the CS to be able to identify the good branches. And um, we have some more data on this now, but we used to always go for branch number two, which was that posterior lateral, uh, and stay away from three, which was more anterior. However, actually, anterior lead placements can do OK. Another example of venogram there. And obviously, we had the simulator. Uh, so final x-ray, 
um, confirms the lead position there of the atrial RV and LV lead. And in the early days, we knew that the greater inter-electro dis distance between the RV and the LV was associated with bigger response. Now we're able to measure this electrically with the QLV. And we'll talk about that actually on the next slide. So some of the factors that impact the response to CRT, there are many. In this was studied, the Cleveland Clinic actually looked at this about eight, nine years ago. They opened up a CRT clinic, a non-responder clinic for folks, for whatever reason, that didn't have a benefit from CRT. And lead position, very important. Pacing burden. So CRT is a pacing therapy. You want the heart to be paced essentially 100%. And so if folks are going in and out of AFib, if they're having frequent PVCs, they're not going to be pacing 100%. They're not going to respond as well to CRT. And that actually needs to be addressed. Uh, LV caps are very important. So um, we will do these implants with as close to a 12-lead ECG as possible. I know we, I think, we have settled on about eight or nine leads. But it's really important to look at the QRS morphology to make sure you're getting LV capture. So one thing that comes up sometimes is this issue of pseudo-fusion. So if your AV timing is off, you'll actually conduct to the ventricle through the native AV conduction system before the LV pacing is able to create a wavefront. And so even though your marker channels will say it's paced, if you look at the QRS, it's actually a left bundle. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a native complex. And, so, and you can't diagnose that on the programmer. That's why it's called pseudo-fusion, because the device thinks it's pacing because it is pacing. However, it's not capturing the ventricle because your timing is off. Uh, those patients, as you can imagine, don't respond to CRT. Now, a little bit of fusion is actually a good thing. And one of the other companies now has a proprietary algorithm to actually optimize fusion between the native QRS and the LV pace QRS, which is great. But you got to have some LV pace. Anodal stimulation was important, particularly in the era of unipolar leads. But typically, we assume when you plug these things in and you're pacing that you're getting stimulation at the cathode, right? And again, if you have a 12 lead, it's very easy to diagnose. But we've done implants, and it, uh, Cleveland Clinic says it happens 9, 10% of the time, where because of charge density and because of other factors, you're getting stimulation at the cathode. So we'll do an implant, for example, and say, OK, Jordan Taylor, let's pace them you know, tip to coil, right? You assume that, or you hope that you're getting capture from the tip. But if the coil starts to capture and your coil's in the right ventricle, you're going to be pacing the RV and not the LV. And then those patients don't respond. Um, arrhythmia, as we talked about, obviously. So AFib needs to be addressed, either with an AV nodal ablation, if it's permanent AFib. We did that, actually, in one of Kara's patients uh, yesterday. Uh, atrial flutter, potentially antiarrhythmic therapy to suppress the arrhythmias. But you've got to do something with the arrhythmias, or else you've put in this you know, $50,000 device, and it's not going to benefit the patient. Um, medications are important. So there's some people who still believe that once they get the CRT device, they don't have to take their medicines anymore. The beta blockers make them impotent. The diuretics make them pee. They don't want to take anything because, well, you, you fix me, right? You put in the CRT device. But we know that, well, all the clinical trials looked at CRT in the setting of background medical therapy. More importantly, we know that there's a synergistic relationship between the medicines and the CRT that's so important to the response. Um, timing is important. And then patient selection. So if you pick patients with a narrow QRS, and there's been study after study that look at this, they don't have a clinical response to CRT, right? Um, if, you, you know, if you take patients who are not optimally medically managed, they're not going to benefit from CRT. Uh, and so this was the breakdown from the Cleveland Clinic experience. And um, they really focused on programming and arrhythmias as being the number one and number two causes of non-response. But again, there's going to be a number of issues that affect whether or not someone responds. And so, you know, which is why we use the term non-responder and not like a CRT failure, because it may not be a CRT failure. Um, in terms of optimization, so there are a number of ways to optimize the timing of the sinus node to when the, the pacing fires. Uh, the gist of it is that if the AV delay is optimal, you basically maximize your diastolic filling pattern. And you can look at this uh, using uh, uh, echo Doppler. Um, you have an early filling wave. You have the atrial kick. And they're optimized to give you the best diastole and then presumably the best systole. Right? If your AV delay is too long, you may get pseudo-fusion. But more importantly, 
your A wave of atrial kick sort of encroaches on your early filling, and so you're not going to get a great diastole. Uh, and it's sort of iatrogenic diastolic dysfunction. And so those folks don't respond as well to CRT. If your AV delay is really, really, really short, that's also a problem because then as soon as your atrium starts to fire, your LV fires, your mitral valve closes, and then you get no more filling. So you cut off your atrial kick. And that truncated A wave, we actually see more than anything else. Uh, and, and, and really, the, the move in CRT now is to lengthen the AV delay a little bit because you get more atrial kick. You also promote a little bit of fusion between the intrinsic wavefront and the pace wavefront, which actually is good for the patient. And that's probably why. You're probably, in, in the old days, we were setting these AV delays of like 100 milliseconds, 90 milliseconds, thinking, okay, we, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we don't want it to be uh, too long. But actually, probably was doing the patient a disservice. Um, so goals of AV optimization, and this is done typically either intraoperatively or like post-op day number one, to improve your diastolic function, ideally to get them to a grade one filling pattern on echo. Um, you want to see clear E wave and A wave, not truncated, not superimposed. And also Cleveland Clinic went even further in terms of timing the A wave relative to the QRS onset to avoid that truncated A wave where the atrium contracts against a closed mitral or tricuspid valve. Uh, they even went so far as to look at pulmonary vein inflow uh, patterns consistent with low filling pressure, so the S and the D wave on echo. Uh, and there, that's an optimal pattern. Uh, and this was actually an HRS from a couple years ago. This was an abstract that the Cleveland Clinic published where you get a nice E wave and A wave. And then you get a nice S and D wave on the pulmonary veins. So they're, they have the in the program, right? So I'm assuming they're doing it to get the they're Exactly. Right? So exactly, which is why, you know, in, in the vignette, that patient was, you know, her, her neck veins were fairly flat. Because if you take folks who are too decompensated or, again, not medically optimized, they're going to come in with these grade 3 and grade 4 restricted filling patterns. And no matter what you do, they're going to feel like crap. You know. um, this was actually the subject of a clinical trial where they looked at the SMART AV algorithm, which was a, a proprietary algorithm to, again, smartly optimize the A and V timing on the device versus folks who just got a fixed AV delay of 120 milliseconds versus echo optimization. So three groups, uh, all implanted with CRT devices. And it was a fairly short follow-up, six months. And so the endpoints were more, uh, not hard mortality endpoints, but looking at things like LV remodeling. And I think the gist of it was that there was no significant difference in outcomes because they all did fairly well. So uh, this whole idea that everyone needs to be echo-optimized probably has fallen by the wayside after this study because we know that, um, again, the AV delay of 120 is not super short. Um, it's sort of a middle-of-the-road AV delay. But empirically setting that AV delay actually was no worse or no better than using echo or using some of these more uh, uh, proprietary tools to optimize the AV delay. They all seem to show improvement. Whether you looked at end systolic volumes, whether you looked at EF, whether you looked at six minute walk, they all did better. And I think that speaks to the power of CRT that you know, no matter what you do, you put the device in, 70% of patients are going to respond. You know? It's really that 30% that we're focusing on in terms of the non-responders and how to get them to turn the corner. Uh, VV optimization is a little bit more controversial because I think it's very hard to show uh, a significant uh, uh, clinical benefit. Um, there have been a lot of echo parameters that we use to try to optimize when the RV versus the LV fires. Um, they have not really shown any clinical benefit in randomized trials. Uh, some, you know, uh, some folks actually are now re-looking at this issue using strain echo. So now we have these new sexy Philips machines that came in a couple weeks ago that have strain packages on them. And the, and the nice thing about strain is that unlike tissue Doppler, there's no angle dependence, particularly if you're using uh, the speckle tracking pattern, uh, which really limited our ability to reproducibly assess the synchrony on echo. Um, and so, you know, stay tuned. I think, you know, back when we were at Duke doing these uh, optimizations, 
you know, a lot of folks were still using the old Echo machines that didn't have 3D Echo, that didn't have speckle tracking. And so there's going to be a new wave of literature that comes out with these methods that may show improvement. Um, classically, and again, this is fraught with limitations, but if you have dyssynchrony mechanically, the way to assess that best was with tissue Doppler. And what you would do is you have a sample volume over the septal mitral annulus, lateral mitral annulus, and you look at how those segments contract during systole. And as you can see, you have your QRS complex. The yellow is your septal wall that comes in and contracts normally. Actually, minus 35% strain is great. Anything greater than minus 20% short, you know, fractional shortening is considered really good. But look what happens to the lateral wall. So the septum is coming in, but the lateral wall actually has what we call a pre-stretch, so it's going the wrong way. And then when it comes in, it comes in late. And so you have that pre-stretch and then delayed contra maximum contraction. That delta is considered, well, that's mechanical dyssynchrony. And that was a classic pattern that people always used to look for on tissue Doppler. However, in, I think it was 2010, there was a large multicenter study called the Prospect, which looked at these parameters and showed they were all bogus. And here's why. So you can't get out of the Duke Echo Lab without going through Joe Kislow, who's now emeritus, but he was actually one of the early pioneers moving from M-mode echo to 2D echo and then from 2D to 3D echo. And he would always say, if you, the limitations of echo are threefold. If you don't point at it, you can't see it. So intra and intra-observer variability, right? If you can't see it, you can't diagnose it. So then all these numbers and published parameters are bogus, right? And then it's not the heart stupid. So echo technology is fraught with artifact, right? You get reverb, you get angle dependence of Doppler, you get ring down, you get, and actually when, when he would pull up an echo picture, he'd point on the first year fellow and say, name five artifacts that are at play in this image, you know? And, and so really to quantitatively assess the synchrony with echo is fraught with limitations. We're getting better now. But again, these are sort of the three things that Joe would always say would limit our ability to accurately assess mechanical desynchrony. And of course, when you talk about desynchrony, there's atrioventricular desynchrony, so between the atrium and ventricles. There's LVRV desynchrony. And then there's the synchrony within the LV itself. And they're all interrelated. Um, and probably the most powerful parameter that we can control is the AV synchrony. So by adjusting the AV timing appropriately, you can fix a lot of this stuff. And that's really been the focus, I think, of a lot of the device companies in terms of algorithms that optimize that AV interval to be able to provide the best overall global synchronous contraction. So lead placement. Um, made at CRT, had a subset of patients where they all got um, their venograms looked at and analyzed in multiple projections. So in RAO, you're able to clearly see base versus apex in where the lead was placed. And they divided it into thirds. There was a basal third, mid-ventricle, and then apical third. In LAO, you're able to better assess septum versus lateral wall, uh, and then posterior versus anterior wall to figure out where, where should we put the lead. Because the textbook always used to say, go for the posterior lateral uh, branch. However, Jad Singh at MGH found something very interesting. So when he looked at these lead placements, whether you were lateral, anterior, posterior, there was no difference in your endpoint of heart failure or death. However, the patients who had an apical lead placement had a 70% increase in heart failure and death. And actually, if you looked at just mortality alone, it was like more than double. Which again, flies in the textbook used to say, well, when you do a CRT, you want to push the lead all the way out to the apex so it doesn't dislodge, right? And now we're pulling all these leads back because of made it CRT. And we're OK with an anterior vein as long as we can keep it in a fairly basal position. And so that's really revolutionized uh, uh, the way we place leads and, and, and do CRT implants. Um, and so we had talked about this a little bit during the, uh, the live session. So QLV is an electrical parameter that we measure intraoperatively. We, I pretty much do this for all of our, our implants now because I think it's very useful. Um, this is an example of two patients. So example one, you measure the onset of the QRS to the LV lead position, 90 milliseconds. OK, that's 
late, right? I mean, 90 milliseconds from the onset of ventricular activation to the LV, I mean, that's a long time, right? Patient two, however, 165 milliseconds. And the question is, which patient has a better response to CRT? And so this was looked at prospectively, and actually this guy does a lot better. So the more electrical delay at the spot you pace, the better the patient has clinically in terms of their response. Um, and the cutoff seems to be around 95 milliseconds. So if you look at improvement in LVEF, improvement in LV systolic volumes, the folks who are less than 95 milliseconds tended to not have much improvement, but greater than 95 milliseconds had substantial improvement. Now, some of that is going to be patient factors, right? So if a patient has a narrow QRS, they're not going to have a lot of dyssynchrony. However, in a patient with a left bundle branch, for example, there are certain spots of the ventricle that activate later than others. And really, the goal of QLV is we'll actually move the lead until we get a QLV that we're happy with. Uh, the nice thing with quadrupolar leads is that you don't have to move the lead anymore. You can just pace from a different pole. Uh, so target was a study looking at echo-guided lead placement. And the hypothesis was that targeting your LV lead placement to the site of latest mechanical contraction and away from areas of scar would enhance CRT response. And so this was a UK study that looked at about 200 patients and randomized them to just put it anywhere versus targeted lead placement. And this was using speckle tracking. So this is the latest echo technology we have to identify dyssynchrony. And it was a fairly short study, so six-month follow-up. They brought him back for echoes to look at remodeling uh, uh, reduction in LV volume. Um, they also secondarily looked at hospitalization in NYHA class. And what they found was if you were able to get the lead either right at the segment, concordant, that was late, or right adjacent to the latest segment, substantial improvement in their LV volumes and their uh, LV ejection fraction. I mean, this is actually statistically significant. Um, if you were away from that uh, uh, early site, so the remote in, perp in, in uh, uh, blue, your all-cause mortality was a lot higher. So getting the lead to the echo-identified late segment or adjacent to that segment was associated with better response. Um, what's the importance of cure restoration and morphology? Well, in made at CRT, they looked at various pre-specified subgroups. Um, they looked at age. Um, and it's funny because older folks actually did better with CRT. They looked at gender. Women did incredibly better with CRT therapy. I mean, their response rate was double that of men. Uh, someone hypothesized that it was because the QRS duration almost, it's, it's gender specific. So uh, a woman with a QRS of 130 behaves more like a man with a QRS of 150. And so part of why we don't want to you know, set a hard cutoff for well, the QRS has to be 150 is because we know a lot of women with narrower QRSs, but still wide, had a substantial benefit. Um, I actually had collaborated at Duke with a group from Copenhagen that was really interested in dyssynchrony. And I said, let's look at the women, let's look at the women. And this was before this, this paper came out, right around the same time. And women actually had more dyssynchrony than men. Like in our CRT clinic, if you just looked at all the folks who met the standard textbook criteria, women had more dyssynchrony. I think it was like 86% dyssynchronous rate as opposed to something like 60% for men. And so there's something about women's hearts when they get heart failure that makes them more likely to respond to CRT. Well, you know, we should start to talk about that. Or before we deny CRT to a woman, for example, with an IVCD or right bundle, let's make some measurements first, you know. Um, and but everything else was, was generally a wash. I mean, people did well regardless of their EF, regardless of their baseline uh, uh, systolic volumes, regardless of their functional class. But it was really the, the big standouts were the women in particular had an incredible response to CRT. Um, same thing in the RAF study, uh, looking at folks with mild heart failure. Now, the one issue was QRS morphology. So we know that the left bundles have a dramatic response to CRT. The non-left bundles, it's a wash. 
non-left bundles come in a couple different flavors. You can be sort of this non-specific IVCD, in which case CRT might have had a marginal uh, uh, difference, but it was not statistically significant, um, versus right bundle where there's really no difference at all. Uh, and that's, you know, again, the number of heart failure patients with the right bundle is fairly small. Um, this was actually some work that we did in the CRT clinic at Duke where we took a patient with a wide right bundle. Symptomatic heart failure was on the transplant list. Did an echo study. Found that his latest activating segment actually was up on the anterior septal wall as opposed to the posterior lateral. So if we put a lead at the conventional, again, this is before made a CRT, if we just put the lead where we normally put it, he would have had no response. But Kevin Jackson, uh, who's now sort of one of the national CRT thought leaders, had the thought to place an RV pacing lead high up on the septum. Brought him back a month later, everything is synchronous. The patient came off the transplant list. Uh, and so he really got interested in looking at these right bundle patients, and maybe you don't put the lead in the same spot you would put them in if they're left bundle. This is actually the subject of a clinical trial that's ongoing uh, at Duke, the PACE RBBB study, uh, where they're taking patients with symptomatic heart failure in a right bundle and randomizing to RV lead only versus CRT with an LV and RV lead, <coughs> looking at all these factors. Um, and actually, they're programming them either with bi-V pacing, RV pacing, or no pacing to sort of see, because there are some folks who get a bi-V and they're a negative responder. They actually get worse, right? And so they'll be able to tease out all of this. Uh, I think they're enrolling through the end of this year, hopefully, data by 2016. Um, so what about pacing for AV block? So we know that there are a subset of patients who get this sort of pacing-induced <coughs> cardiomyopathy. So they go, get into heart block. You put in an RV lead. And you know, Karen and I had a young woman actually very bad heart failure after she had uh, uh, RV pacing for heart block. Her EF went down to 30%. And the question is, should these patients be getting CRT? Should any of these patients be getting CRT? So the Block HF trial looked at this. And they took folks, about 700 folks, who had a pacing indication. So they were going to get something for AV block. And their EF had to be less than or equal to 50, so subnormal LV function. And they were randomized to getting RV pacing versus CRT pacing. And if they met ICD implantation criteria, they would get the ICD. And they looked at death. They looked at heart failure. They looked at remodeling. And tremendous benefit, actually, the folks who got by V pacing stayed event free at an average of about three year follow up, but they, some folks went out to six years uh, compared to RV only pacing. So it's a preemptive strike in these folks with an EF less than 50%. If you know they're going to be paced for heart block, to throw in the CRT device. Um, what tools can we use to help get the LV lead to the best location? Um, I had more on this. Uh, uh, in, in, in a talk I gave last year, but to, to keep it simple, really the quadrupolar lead has really revolutionized the way we're able to get these implants you know, um, done, I think, quicker, because we're not fishing, moving the lead 10 different times to get the right spot. Uh, the lead basically has, as you saw, four different poles on it, but you can pace from up to 10 different configurations, because you can pace between poles, you can pace across poles, you can pace from one, the LV lead over to the RV coil. So you have a number of different options for pacing. And the uh, study that was done when this came out, looking at survival free of LV lead failure or revision is, I mean, essentially no one had to get revived. I mean, it's very rare that we have someone with a quad lead that we say, we need to go back in because we didn't get it right because either they have phrenic or it was a non-responder because of the ability to program 10 different pacing configurations. And now the, the newer generation are going to come out with 14 different configurations. So this has really revolutionized the way, you know, uh, there, there, sometimes you'll do implants and you'll reach for a unipolar or bipolar lead for a very small vessel. And you're like, gosh, we really need to get these quadrupolar leads in different sizes so that we can use it for everyone. Um, 
Coronary sinus venoplasty sometimes comes into play, and, and Seth Worley and actually my uh, mentor, Kevin Jackson, are now the thought leaders nationally for this, where they're actually able to go in with standard angiography techniques and interventional techniques to actually balloon through narrowed areas. And very rarely, we've had implants where, because of a kink or stenosis, we can't get the lead to track over the wire. So there is a limited, I think, role now uh, for venoplasty techniques. We haven't been doing them here at, at Swedish, but it's something where, it's funny, when this came out, like a year later, the quad lead came out. But I think there's still a limited role for bringing patients back if we really need to get the lead to a certain spot to actually plasty open a stenosis uh, to get through. Um, and then there's an example of with, with angioplasty, they're able to basically open up this posterolateral lateral vein, get the wire out, get the lead out. But again, this, you know, this isn't a quad lead. This is a bipole lead, right? So back to the case vignette. So this is our woman with the left bundle branch block in class three heart failure. We did a lot of cardiac MRIs. She was non-ischemic. She had no significant scar burden. Uh, she had the CRT lead placed empirically in a lateral vein. Um, she had empiric AV and VV timing. We didn't use echo. Uh, and then the plan was to refer her for an echo optimization if there was no response at three to six months. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.